Welcome back to the broadcast, our world-to-world -world coverage of the political party primaries with a special focus on uh, what was to be a big day for the United Democratic Alliance. Uh, the Deputy Party, William, the Deputy President William Ruto-led political party, which had its primaries today in 35 counties. We have a team of journalists spread out across the country to just give us a blow-by-blow -blow account of what has been happening throughout the day with the voting uh, being um, disrupted in many of those uh, polling stations and many of those uh, constituencies and counties. I will be joined in, on this broad broadcast by several of them. I have with me from the county of Nandi, uh, Kennedy Moredi, and of course at the UDA headquarters, uh, Zainab Ismail. My panel is also here with me. I have with me a lawyer and uh, governance expert, uh, Joe Mdivo. I have also with me Professor Collins Odote, uh, Dean Faculty of Law at the University of Nairobi and also uh, Professor Masibo Lumala from uh, Moi University from the School of Information Sciences, I have to mention. Uh, I'll, I shall be coming to you late, a, a bit later on. Let me, let, me, let me go to the UDA headquarters here in Nairobi where NTV Zainab Ismail is standing by for us. Uh, Zainab, good evening. Uh, we did hear part of the Deputy President's um, an address uh, at, at the top at, at 9 p.m. What was that about? Can you give us a summary of what has happened at the UD headquarters? Right, I hope you can hear me. I hope you can hear me, Ben, quite clearly now. I'm saying good evening. And it's been quite the long day in the other parts of the country as well, where the UDA nominations have been ongoing. And the Deputy President, William Maruto, indeed uh, gave us a press briefing. That will be the last media briefing today after the conclusion of the UDA nominations across the various parts in the country. And he actually acknowledged the fact that there's still voting uh, processes happening in some of the We seem to be having we seem to be having a technical hitch there with the audio of Zeta Bismile. We'll try to re-establish connection with her to just find out what uh, has been happening with the UDA nominations uh, across the country today. Following that address by the UDA party leader, Deputy President William Bruto. Before we go on, I shall be taking you to the county of Nandi shortly uh, and other places during this broadcast. Let me bring in my panelists uh, quickly uh, to start this off. Uh, Joy, if I begin with you, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, before we go to the UDA nominations, uh, a lot has been happening around the, uh, the DP. We did see some drama on the floor of the House where uh, the Wajia woman representative, Fatma Gedi, tried to table some dossier uh, linking uh, the deputy president to claims of land grabbing. What, what is your take on, on this vis-a-vis -vis the day it happened? Well, thank you for having me. When you're looking at a political party situation, if one of your opponents seem to have a really big day, one of the attempts that you need to have is to try and upstage them. And what I saw today was an attempt to also create an alternative um, point of focus rather than just having the UDA nominations being the big story. If you looked at all the media houses today, most of them were basically covering the UDA nominations almost live as if it was a general election. So I, I was... Uh, quite glad for a little bit of distraction, which is what uh, Parliament provided. Are you saying we were a bit too much? No, you, you weren't. You're looking for ratings. You're looking to inform Kenyans. So it's, it's the nature of the game. That's how it goes. Because ODM chose to do their nominations rather low-key, and that has served them in good stead, because unlike previous years where they've had very uh, chaotic nominations, they had a pretty good uh, run this time round. But that said... If it's really good, I mean, if a man bites a dog, that's when it's news. Right. And I guess that's what the UDA nominations provided. So what we saw in Parliament, in my opinion, was the other side of the coin, trying to also, you know, have a little bit of airtime. Because even when you listen to what uh, Honorable Gedi was trying to raise, mm. I mean, it, these, are, it, these are things that are already in the, in the public domain. It's public reports, it's court records, it's uh, allegations and innuendo. So it, there was nothing earth-shatteringly new. Right that she presented, but it, it was good distraction for right. while it lasted. Prof, do you think it worked? 
uh, first of all, do you think that is what was meant to, to happen to the UDA nominations? What's your, what's your take on the drama at Parliament today? I think it's the Speaker of the National Assembly who, when he was cornered, made an, a statement that explains what's going on. Uh, the Speaker said, you know, we are in an interesting season. Uh, and I think the critical thing is we are in the silly season of politics. Mm. So anything that you can do to get mileage, to distract your opponent. So if you ask whether it served this purpose, it depends on what the purpose was. And I think uh, Joy is right about the purpose. The purpose was to provide a counter-narrative. To that extent, it was useful because then it's you had some it. entertainment, you had some, in the, the view of the other side, you had an opportunity of getting back a conversation, uh, which is a narrative that uh, for the political people who are on the audience side, and as me, it's useful for them right. to say, you know, the DP is a land grabber, the DP is a corrupt person. So as opposed to focusing on their nominations, you focus on the integrity of the DP president. For that purpose, it was useful for them. All right. We'll get, we'll get into who did it right in terms of the nominations, the low-key stagger nominations or the one big day that, like we saw in UDA. Professor Lumala, if you can hear me, um, the Speaker of the National Assembly, Justin Muturi, getting, uh, got into the thick of things today at the floor of the National Assembly following that uh, dossier that was being tabled, or an attempt to do so, at least by the, the Wajia woman representative. Uh, where, how, can you how, could you, how would you describe the, the Speaker's position, having you know, declared his presidential ambitions and then dropping, dropping off and then joining Kenya Kwanzaa? How, where do you think he, he stands in this? Well, um, first of all, thank you for having me uh, in this conversation. I know that this afternoon there was that uh, conversation that happened in the parliament and it looked very acrimonious. I do not think that there is anyone who would be very happy with what happened, especially bearing in mind what uh, uh, Honorable... Fatuma Gedi was presenting insofar as the allegations relating to land grabbing uh, goes. And uh, I'm, I'm not so, sh so sure that uh, the Speaker of the National Assembly handled the, the affair quite well, uh, bearing in mind that uh, uh, as the conversation went on, he, he looked at some point to be very harsh on Fatuma Kedi, and she had to come up and keep, kept on insisting that she should not be gagged. And I think the subsequent events leading to the uh, postponement of the House to next Tuesday were not very, very, very good. But yes, they kind of wanted to, to take away the gains that were from UDA on their big day. So, yeah, that's my take. All right, Joy, how would you describe the, the, the speaker's position in all this drama? As far as I'm concerned, what he owes fidelity to is the law and what the standing orders are. And I saw him trying to balance both, but it was difficult for him because once you've already stated your political position, even if you're trying to say something that is in the letter of the law, as long as it doesn't look like it's favoring your chosen side, then you look like you're being biased. So he was walking a tightrope today. Yeah. And f remember, because of the nominations, the UDA side of the house, the UDA leaning side of the house, were not present, most of them were not present. So he didn't have his usual quote unquote backup yeah. to give any, any uh, balance out. So I would agree, he, he came across as walking a tightrope. And I think the decision to adjourn makes sense because both sides have got time to go and recalibrate. Ms. Gedi can go and put her dose here maybe more succinctly in a way that she can deliver quickly and uh, on time so that she gets every, because today she only managed to do three papers. And one of them was her own statement. Right. So because she had a whole suitcase, a briefcase, I think she had a lot more to say. So this gives her time to go put that together. But also it cools temperatures because right. by the time they come back in May, uh, yeah. some, some things will have been lost, some regions will have been crossed over, nominations will be finished. A lot will have happened, definitely. Yeah. Lots of drama from the floor of the house. I want us to go to uh, the nominations proper for, for UDA. But before I go to my colleague, Kennedy Morithi, in the county of Nandi, uh, Prof., um, a lot of pundits have been having this debate over how to do political party nominations in this country. Do, we, do, pot, do parties go big like UDA did today or do they try to look for consensus and direct nominations and stagger it, you know, take, take some punch of it? Which is the right way in your perspective? I think uh, two things. Uh, the first one is our problems is not party primaries. Our problems 
is political parties, uh, the political parties democracy. <laughs> because the reality is we continue to be grappling with what a real political party is. And I don't think we've gotten it. That's the big problem. But if you look at it from a time scale, Ben, from 2013 to 2022, we are better off than we were in 2013. Yeah. That's, I think it's important to put that into perspective. If you looked at political parties in 2013, it was a nightmare. Uh, there were things being burnt all over, people crying. So th in 2017, remember, Jubilee actually had to postpone their party primaries because of logistical nightmares. So if we look at it, I think from a time scale and looking at it overall, I think that parties have done a better job than they did in 2022. Having said so, in my view, uh, we need to ensure that we give we give members of political parties an opportunity to nominate. So I am very averse to these things where people try and say we are giving direct party to X, we are giving direct party to Y. I think it is the MP for Homer Bay constituency who I listened to saying something. And he's a member of parliament, he's having a start up and saying the party needs to be much more clearer to us. So you can imagine if somebody is running and he doesn't know whether they are going mm -hmm. to have uh, ad uh, either nominations or not, mm -hmm. I think that there must be much more clarity in doing things. As to whether you do it one bank or you stagger it, I think what is important is the logistical arrangements that you have. Right. There is a benefit of doing it one bank because then uh, the spotlight is on you. But if you get it wrong in terms of logistical nightmares, then mm -hmm. sometimes when you stagger it, you All get right. the opportunity of making the arrangements. All right, we'll get back to that. But let, for now, let's cross over to the county of Nandi, where my colleague, uh, NTV political reporter uh, Kennedy Moredi, is standing by, has been uh, since early this morning. Kennedy, good evening. It has been an extremely long day for you, for all of us, as we try to uh, tell Kenyans what's happening in the political party primaries, today being the UDA's day. Um, what is the latest from where you are? mostly from this region have been waiting to see whether it is going to go out and if it does then they are willing that they are the ones who are going to be chosen at the end of the day we have been traversing the whole county uh, the whole six constituencies of this nandi county where all of them we have been seeing the voting patterns and all that has been happening but right now they are the county tallying station that is at the CICT. I have seen about four padlocks that are securing that particular area. And in the security of that particular area, that basically means that they are not ready yet to receive all the others that is going on. But all the other constituencies we have been able to see that in a number of them, just like the one that we've just left at Kapsa Bet Girls a few minutes ago, counting was already underway we cannot say who is uh, who is leading at this time and who is not as we've not been able to see that from the county tallying station remember at the cict bishop muge sek school that is the training that is the only place that we'll be able to see when all these other votes will be streaming in but what i can also tell you ben is that we've also been able to see a lot of propaganda within the last uh, three hours since seven o'clock when uh, results probably from the agents started streaming into the political uh, contenders in this particular election what we are also likely to see is that spanning into the overnight and into morning probably as they try to set the stage for whatever they do believe will be an announcing of their victory. But what we do know as of now, there is no official communication with regards to the voter to the voter counting, to the votes counting that has already ended. And remember, since this uh, program started a bit at around, uh, at around in other stations at around one o'clock or two o'clock, then there was an extension that has seen uh, people vote into the night probably by seven o'clock and others were now collecting that information and taking it and remember that is the only time so probably in the next uh, 30 minutes or so then we will be heading into the CICT Bishop Muge that is when some of these results will be streaming in so that we are able to know what is being taken from which constituency or from which ward all of them will be allowed to bring in all their information there then probably we'll be knowing who has taken what but as it stands right now there is no official communication with regards to that there was just an incident where election material was burnt at the kipture uh, primary school where we saw people 
who we cannot say right now are goons or whether they were hired or not or whether they were dissatisfied with the with what was going on they came in took the ballot boxes and started kicking them out once they were able to collect all the voting material in the name of the voting ballot papers they went and set them ablaze the, the UDA party has given a press conference just a few minutes ago and in that press conference they were able to say that in the event that they do find out that any of the candidates is involved in any of the violence that is being witnessed, then there's a probability that they will be taking stand action on that particular person. So as we stand right now, we know that that information is going on. Uh, action is being taken, investigations have already started and we'll be giving you an up-to-date information. As we live here probably in the next 30 minutes as we are in one of the polling stations, we will be going and counting is just going on behind us. Then we'll be able to go into the tallying center, that is CICT, where we'll be camping until morning and we do expect probably if they are not exaggerating, probably at four o'clock, some of the contenders, it will be shaping up to see what will be happening and who will be taking what position in this particular Nandi County. As of hitches, there were not so much hitches here, except for that particular polluting station that we've been able to see that uh, the, the material has been banned. They have been able to say that they will speak on that particular matter. But as of now, we can only wait. Ben. And you can breathe coming to us live from the county of Nandi, where a tough battle in the gubernatorial race is expected. And of course, in the senatorial race as well, uh, not much happening in terms of uh, the vote counting and tallying. So still early days. It's going to be a long night for many of our teams out there. Before I go to the UD headquarters, uh, where Zena Bismail is, uh, Professor Lumala, let me come to you. Um, we have seen a lot of uh, chaos and uh, uh, the issues of uh, burning of elect election materials in the county of Embu and also like we are getting uh, to know in the county of Nandi, we saw uh, an altercation in the county of Bomet as well. Were you expecting this kind of um, um, situation, uh, judging by the, the, in, the enormous way in which the UDA party was taking this nomination exercise? Well, I wouldn't say that anyone expected this, but uh, it is not unusual and uncommon for violence sometimes to raise its ugly head during elections in Kenya. And in this particular case, I think we, we will say that the M1 was the least expected because I didn't, one would not have expected the competition to be that stiff in M1. Uh, in areas like Bomet, areas like Nandi, uh, you would imagine, Ben, that for some of them, this is almost like a general election, that once you are nominated on a UDA ticket, you are almost assured, you are like one leg inside the office that you are vying for. If you are want to be MCA, you want to be a governor or a senator in this region, it is inevitable that you really want to be nominated. And so the competition must have been pretty stiff. Uh, and then also remember that uh, while UDA went out of its way to hold nominations in almost what we are hearing, 36 counties, this was not expected per se. Uh, the assumption is that even IEBC with all the funding that it receives from government sometimes has its own challenges when it comes to security issues. So I can imagine how UDA must have been transporting the ballot papers from Nairobi to different destinations and the challenges that must have been there with the security of those papers. Uh, but generally speaking, I think uh, it's because of the serious competition that is within uh, the party that we are, we saw a bit of the violence and skirmishes in different parts of the country, in Nairobi, in Nandi, in Bomet, and uh, in uh, Embu yesterday. I, as I bring Prof and uh, Jerm Devo, let me let me let me take us to the UDA headquarters for for a self to, for us to get a self appraisal from from the UDA party leader uh, Zainab Ismail is there for us, Zainab. Uh, good evening. It has been a long day for you as well. Uh, I'm not even sure if you've been able to break your fast. Uh, what, what can we take from the, the DP's address earlier this evening? Well, indeed, it has been a long day, and I know my colleague Kennedy Muredi touched on some of the issues that the Deputy President uh, spoke on today. He came in to give his last media briefing 
here on the UDA nominations across the country. In fact, acknowledging the fact that uh, there still is a voting ongoing in some parts of uh, the polling stations, uh, for example, Nyandarua, some parts of Kiambu, some parts of Embu, I believe he mentioned that uh, voting is still ongoing and he says this is to uh, just give uh, the voters an, a chance to be able to uh, support uh, the aspirants that they wish uh, to vie for you know, the certain tickets and of course get those tickets. Well, the uh, UDA um, party leaders have also uh, come out very strongly to assure uh, the UDA aspirants that in case of any disputes arising that there are internal structures uh, within the party to be able to resolve these matters and remember this is coming out because we've witnessed a number of issues coming up from the nominations uh, chaos that marred some of the polling stations delays and even a late opening of some of the polling stations and as well as um, a voter rigging uh, claims that we've also seen in some parts of uh, uh, the polling stations and uh, uh, ballot stuffing as well. So these are some of the issues that the deputy president uh, said will be able to be handled uh, by the internal party uh, structures through the electoral disputes resolution committee that has been formed. And he says that this will continue. This committee will sit down from today, uh, this evening, and will continue through Easter and to be able to receive all those complaints from aspirants who might have felt that uh, as uh, uh, they were, you know, in uh, rights were infringed upon uh, from these uh, uh, nominations. And of course, just to also mention that uh, uh, some of the aspirants uh, that were involved allegedly in the chaos that were marred in several parts, specifically Bomet and Nandi, uh, counties, uh, the uh, party leader of the UDA party uh, says that uh, there will be stern action taken against such aspirants saying, uh, and remember also earlier on that the National Elections Board of the UDA mentioned that they risk being disqualified from the nomination. They could be suspended or even expelled from the UDA party if found culpable or having been uh, taken part in any of those issues that uh, revolved around chaos and violence in this nomination. And uh, away from that, of course, uh, what we know is that um, Nominations, uh, repeat nominations have been scheduled uh, in different days, but what we also know that those, most of the repeat nominations will be happening on Tuesday next week. There are some of the polling stations that uh, um, they could not continue with the nominations for various issues. And of course, one of the also the issues that they also mentioned uh, most importantly was uh, what they termed as logistical challenges and constraints that they were facing in terms of specific specifically transferring this ballot equipment to those polling stations. So uh, Ben, basically um, the deputy president uh, um, gave himself a pat on the back, uh, saying that uh, the UDA party primaries have been quite successful and according to their own opinion and uh, uh, looking at the way things went, they're saying that uh, they've been able to achieve most of uh, what they wanted to achieve in this nomination and saying this is uh, probably perhaps, in their opinion, the most democratic, free, fair, credible uh, nomination that uh, the country has seen. So, Ben, uh, tomorrow, like what we know, the count and uh, telling is still ongoing. Uh, it has begun from today in different polling stations. That will com uh, continue through the night till tomorrow morning. So we don't have any timelines or deadlines in terms of uh, uh, the final vote counts or the final uh, telling. So that uh, we will be able to just see through the next few days that uh, uh, this nomination process will be taking place. But we also just also importantly to note um, is the fact that uh, the, the, at the polling stations, that's where the aspirants, those who win the nominations will be be getting uh, their certificates and after that uh, they will go to the telling center uh, and also now get their nomination certificate so maybe in the next few days maybe even by tomorrow we'll be able to get a very clear picture of how the issuance of the certificates will be done Ben thank you sir. thank you Zainab Zen Zainab smile for us live at the UDA headquarters here in Nairobi before we take a quick commercial break joy uh, UDA are giving themselves a pat on the back some of them saying 99% success. What is your, how do you rate them, their nominations? I think uh, based on the numbers that I have seen on Twitter and on some of the social media handles from the party, 
out of the votes, the, uh, out of the polling stations that they say they recorded problems, they are looking at about 1.25%, 1, 1. I think, is what I saw as having been problematic. So that's less than 200 out of the, I think, 1,600 that they were looking at. Right. So by whatever standards, I, and I, on this score, I agree with, with Professor, uh, Professor Collins that actually you can see a progression with political parties as far as dominations are concerned. Right. Because they used to be quite a sham and very unpredictable. But with this, we've also had, I think earlier, the National Election Board also gave a, a statement and said, even in the areas where there was disruption, they are slated for a repeat on the 19th of April. So they still have given themselves contingency to be able to beat the April 22 deadline. All right. So all in all, I think in most places, the people will be getting somebody that they actually feel is the strongest candidate. Right. So I would agree with them. They've done fairly well on... I, I would wager a much smaller budget that the IB, than okay. the IBC would do. Prof, before we get into the deeper issues, on a scale of 10, your rating for the UD nominations? I can give them an 8. Uh, to do this on one day, it's not an easy thing. And mm -hmm. I think if you look at the scale of the, the complaint, it, the, your reporter mentioned Embu and mentioned Nandi. I think in the scale of nominations that they have done, to mention two are standing out, it's a good thing. I think right. they've done well. All right, let's take a quick commercial break here on the program. When we come back, we'll be getting into some of the issues that have been coming uh, to the fore from the day-long nomination, the voting, uh, the hitches, and what it means uh, going forward in terms of the political party system in the country. We are seeing we are in the era of political coalition and political and collision political parties. What it means uh, going forward? Don't go too far. This is NTV. At the first sign of pain, you need a solution that you can trust. Try Panadol Advance. With Panadol's Optizod formula, the tablet absorbs quickly and starts providing fast and effective pain relief. You can trust. Try Panadol Advance. Wow, ni hao. Moza tu anapea na hao. Ah, we, funga mshipi. Alafu wekelea multibet. Wow. Ni hao, na kuna mshindi wa senke daily For 30 days ah, We, funga mshipi, alafu wekelea multibet Wow, ni hao, Mozart wana peana 4 bedroom Hit the longest one multibet daily Ushinde hao, kuwa mshindi, Mozart Are you a health beneficiary with an outstanding loan? From the 1st of March to the 30th of April 2022 we are offering you a 100% COVID-19 penalty waiver. Kamilisha Malipuyakoya help Leo. All our dreams can come true, and help is the best place to empower our dreams. Kamilisha, Kamilisha Malipuya help. help. Take advantage of the 100% penalty waiver and clear your help loan today. Terms and conditions apply. Higher Education Loans Board. Empowering dreams. <laughs> Feel it, it's real. Coca-Cola, real magic. First lady. Everyone, everyone, one moment. I want to ask you one last thing, please. 
I have a social magazine that wants to ask us some questions. It will take two minutes, not more. Please, okay? Ooh, Diego, I didn't say hello to you properly. Yes, and happy oh, birthday. thank you. Look, Father, we have to go, so we can't do it. Let's go. Go and check that what I'm saying to you is true. Nancy, you cannot take the right to be with my daughter away from me. If you want to be next to your daughter, you have to be next to me. It's that simple. You know that I will stay in line if you treat me right, but with pressure and threats, I don't. Now this week on The Trend, we have an amazing list of artists lined up for you. And of course, this show is not a show without the music. Tuko na DJ Ipale kwenye ones and twos. Ana kuchanga nishia ma mix vile inapa. Mbia mono kabisa. And of course, the biggest show has the host with the mostest. Amina Abiraba. Mbia mono. I will be by your side. The Trend in association with Tasca. Excessive alcohol consumption. Welcome back to the broadcast here on NTV, our world to world uh, coverage, rolling coverage of these political party nominations. Uh, we are heading to the business end of things, so to speak, but it's still early days, uh, things moving quite slow uh, in terms of the vote, tallying, vote counting, uh, with voting having started late in a lot of those polling stations across the 35 counties where UDA uh, conducted their nominations. But uh, we have been uh, taking a look at some key races in some of those cons uh, constituencies and counties and uh, a keen eye on the gubernatorial races. Uh, there's one in the county of Wasangishu uh, that is a six-person uh, race featuring the likes of Jonathan B., uh, Caleb Kositan, the SOI MP, Sarah Serem, Ambassador, Ambassador Julius Bitok as well. Uh, there's another key race in the county of Nandi where the current governor, uh, Stephen Sang, is uh, uh, seeking to stay, to hold on to power. He's being uh, a competing, he's competing with former governor, uh, that is uh, Cleophas uh, Lagat, as well as uh, Elijah Lagat, uh, former MP, and Antipas Tirop, as well as uh, Alan Kosgei. Uh, of the Kosgei family in the county of Nandi. Elgeo Marakwet as well, another one. Uh, Wesley Roti, Joseph Boynet seeking to come into the fray. <coughs> and of course the country of Kericho where the former CS Charles Kater uh, is battling it out with, uh, uh, with Mutai where we have re had reports from our, our teams on the ground that it is a neck and neck battle. As we wait to see where uh, the telling will leave us. Prof, what is that, um, what are some of those uh, battles that do stand out for you, even as we wait for, for what the results of these nominations are? I think for me, the greatest battle for me are in two places. Uh, actually, two or three. I think the first one is the battle in Kericho. Uh, the battle in Kericho is interesting because you, if you follow the debates, I think uh, where it's money vis-a-vis -vis, uh, citizens. I think that's an interesting conversation because it, it tries to have us have a conversation about what's the place of money in politics. I think we've grown up uh, over the last few years knowing the more money you have, uh, the higher the chances that you will win. To have a situation where you are hearing the reverse from early signs, that's, that's going to be an interesting outcome for me. I think the second, and we're discussing this offline, is places where governors are running for Senate positions. Uh, I think there's been a lot of conversation. Is it legal? Is it not? I think it's immoral. Thank you. Uh, you the reason why you are supposed to finish your term and retire <laughs> is so that you go and rest. But here people are finishing their term, then you hear somebody wants to be an MP, somebody wants to be a senator. So I think it's interesting to see what kind of messages uh, uh, voters will be sending to governors who are running to be senators. That's happening in Embu. That's happening in Wasingishu. Was right. uh, that was supposed to happen in somewhere in uh, Siaya. I don't think it eventually got to happen. So those for me are the, the, the votes are places that really stand out for me in terms right. of red, races to watch. Joy, before you give me your the ones that do stand out for you, what's your take on the issue of governors uh, finishing their terms and going to the Senate, running for Senate? Quite frankly, I'm very unimpressed by that move. 
Because as Professor has pointed out, there's a reason why a governor's position has a term limit. It's the same reason why you have a term limit for the presidency, so that you make your contribution as the chief executive of your county, and then you take time to rest. Now, the senator's role is to play some oversight role over what the governor does. Now, if you've been governor, and then now you want to go to Senate, we can only surmise that there are things that you did during your term that you want to keep neat and tidy and under lock and key. So I agree with Professor, it's, it's not only immoral, it also smacks of a certain arrogance that your people have no other leaders apart from you. In this day and age, we have realized that anybody can be a leader as long as there's enough nature and nurture, the right mix of nature and nurture, to be able to help somebody manifest their leadership qualities. So quite frankly, if the former governors trying to be senators have it rough tonight, I am one happy bunny. All right. Professor Lomala, you are right at the epicenter of... Uh uh, one of the strongest battles in the county of Wasengishu, one of those counties where uh, the deputy president, William Ruto, and his UDA uh, party have decided not to interfere in any way whatsoever in terms of trying to look for consensus. They've let people vote, and there's a lot of, there are a lot of battles there. And one of those that, uh, that uh, Prof and, and Joey are talking about, a governor who is running for Senate, how, how are those battles coming along from what you can be able to tell? Uh, first of all, let me join Joy and uh, my colleague Prof in agreeing that uh, in all fairness, it doesn't make a lot of sense that you have been a governor and then you now want to be a, a senator. The reason for my argument is like what Joy says, there's a conflict of interest. There will definitely come a moment when the Senate will want to investigate something that happened in Wasingishu County while uh, Governor Manda goes on in office. So I can only imagine how it will turn out in a situation where he's to be invited as a witness by his fellow senators should he be able to win uh, the election and become the Senate uh, candidate for, for Wasingishu. So, yeah, uh, but uh, as it were, it is within his right. I think the law did not go ahead to bar people who have become, who have served as governors to run as senators. It only stops them from running again as a governor. So to that extent, you can give it to them. I, I do know that uh, we've had people who have been senators and have gone to, gov to run as governors, uh, like the way it happened with our brother, Boni Halwale, and then there are those who have become, uh, who wish to live and go to become senate, senators. So yeah, there's a bit of a, a gray area in terms of the law to that extent. But yes, if we have a term limit, there is a reason why we have that limit. There are other people who have uh, the opportunity and who can serve even much better than maybe Mr. Uh, Governor Mandago in the event that he doesn't win. And so that does not really worry me because the people will make a decision based on what they think is the best thing for them in Wasingishu County. All right, thanks, Prof. Prof, um, many, back to UDA as, as a party. It is the newest of the major political parties. There are some who are calling it, are, are saying it is where UD, ODM were um, about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, some pundits predicting fallouts, major fallouts following this very contested um, nomination exercise. Is that a good thing for the DP and his party, necessarily? Which and the fallout or the new party? The, the, the fallout that will be there, the competition that is being seen and, and the effort he has to put in to make sure he manages all that. I think uh, by its very nature, politics has interests. So the competitions does not worry me. I think the fallout is inevitable in the political process. I think for me, what worries me is what I talked about at the start, uh, that you can't judge UDA from the 2022 elections. You need to judge UDA from what happens by 2027 because we've seen too many parties that start very well and disappear after a short while. ODM, uh, Jubilee in 2027. So that's the, what worries me is the longevity of parties. I would like a situation where we have parties that are permanent. You know, three, four, five parties. If you go to the US, you have the Republicans, you have the Democrats. They can build systems. They can be able to build onto their gains. But we have been so used to a situation where a party comes and they go through one, it's one hit wonder. Mm. Uh, the hit ones. The next time, you're rebuilding afresh. So it's UDA today, the next day you'll hear it's called a different part. So that's the thing that worries me most. The fallout, I think, is inevitable, is expected. But the DP has done an interesting thing. 
uh, the interesting thing that I think you mentioned a little bit, uh, if you realize in his backyard, he didn't attempt consensus. Why? Uh, because if you are a political analyst, you will know that in my stronghold, anybody who wins on that ticket will support me. So I don't need to start having a negotiation between myself and uh, between Ben and uh, Joy. Because whoever of them wins, each of them is my supporter. Let them go and fight it out. I think that was a very smart strategy, in my view, in terms of what he did in the Rift Valley. All right. Mm. But just to, to buttress his uh, prof's point, when we get to a place where the parties outlive their founders, then they'll have a real chance to set up the structures that you're talking about. Because as long as we still have this luminary living and looming large mm -hmm. over the political party, then there is a certain level of where the structures will reach, but there's a place where the word of the, of the king has to, to take uh, center stage. So po for most of these parties, give them another 10 years if they survive that long, and then we'll see an emergence. Now, Kanu is the first one that had that, uh, that exam, and we see how they have faltered a little bit, but they're trying to pick themselves up ag again. They're making the same mistake by keeping in place people who are related to the, the founders as continuing with the party. But the fact that they have managed to hang on for me, tells me that Kanu is a party to watch in the next like 15, 20 years after most of the intrigues of this other new, the, the one hit wonders. Right. Once, once they're gone, then you will find maybe that Kanu might emerge stronger. Right. So if parties like UDA, ODM, which right now look like they might still have the, the there's enough support for them to go the, the long hog, if they resist the temptation of falling into the founder's trap then eventually these could be national parties that could outlive right. being special purpose vehicles cobbled together just for elections. All right. You know, I'm laughing, Joy, because one of the tweets I saw was someone was asking today, who was the key decision maker in the nominations? Was it the National Elections Board or was it the DP President William Ruto? Because you heard us being told DP was making the last uh, press call. I'm like, why is the DP the one giving us the press statement? Yes, it's a national election board. So it just goes down to the point that Joe mm. is making. Yeah. We need parties to outlive their founders so that their structures can be stabilized. All right. Mm. Uh, Prof. Lumala, uh, Joy mentions the, the, the Supremos looming large over their political parties. Making what, what, is, what, in your opinion, do you think makes uh, the political parties in Kenya just special purpose vehicles for, for, for elections? Why, why don't we have... Uh, you know, CCMs and, and ANCs in Kenya, in your opinion? Yeah, I, I think Professor alludes to it, uh, the, the idea of why don't we have uh, uh, the, Demo the Republicans and the Democratic Party the way we, it is in the case of the U.S.? Why don't we have the, the, the Conservatives and Labour in the U.K.? And uh, then we have here every other election, we have hard coalitions that die as soon as the elections are over. F look at uh, in the area of Odium, for example, they have, we've had NASA, then we had uh, CORD, and then now we are having ASMIO. So how sure are we that ASMIO will be around in 2027? Uh, the same thing is, I think the, the problem lies with how we put up our political parties and the very fact that even as we speak today, people who are members of UDA found themselves members. They did not pay up to become members. So there's no commitment in political parties, I think, from where I sit. Uh, we have people, at some point, Jubilee, I remember MPs, when they used, to, they tried to use membership of the party to, to nominate, then MPs will go out of their way to buy the political party membership cards and dish them out to the public. So from where I sit, I think one of the things we must start working on is how can we strengthen political parties? How can we ensure that their offices go on for five years and not just pop up when elections are around and as soon as the elections are over, then these offices are closed down? Uh, how do we ensure that the leadership of these parties... Uh, look at, for example, ANC and Ford Kenya, which are part of Kenya Kwanzaa Alliance. They have actually been here longer than uh, UDA. But they have not been working to build and strengthen these parties into national outfits over time. And so as a result, UDA comes around, and today the deputy president is the candidate and the leader of the coalition, yet 
the likes of ANZ and Musalim Dabadi and Ford Kenya and Moses Wetangula have been there longer. We would have expected that the reverse would be true, but that is not the case. So give it to William Ruto for putting together a party that has ha quickly had a national appeal, unlike what we have had. And like we, we are being told, let's just pray that come 2027, UDA will be there. Uh, and that it will not die the natural death right. and the coalitions will be stronger. Thank you. All right. Joy, let's, let's, let's talk about quickly before, before we wind up about the issue of money and resources and what uh, this, how, how this plays, what role this plays in making parties what they are in Kenya. Uh, pundits have been, you know, criticizing political parties saying that they do not have resources to conduct, for example, nominations that, you know, pass the threshold of universal suffrage. So that, that, that puts them at danger of having one person funding the political party, therefore becoming that supremo. How, how, how important is that issue of resources? It's very important because that's why we passed a law that says that there should be set up a fund that actually funds political parties from the exchequer because these are organizations that are set up in trust for the Kenyan people. So it recognizes that the role of political parties is not for the Supremos, the role of the political parties is for the Wananchi. Now, maybe we need to take it a step further and see that the fund is managed in such a way that it grows mm -hmm. rather than the money comes in and it is spent and expended. So, for example, right now, uh, once we are done with the, uh, with the elections in August, yeah. most of those parties that become parliamentary parties will have a windfall. Now, if there's no structure in place to use that as seed money to have it grow, to wait for the nomination money so that the account of the parties uh, is usually in funds, you find that then there's a struggle because you have uh, all these activities that you have between one election and another. Mm -hmm. You have the regular contributions from all your parliamentarians because anybody who goes in on the party ticket has to make a monthly contribution to the party. You have membership. Many parties charge a membership fee for certain levels of membership. So political parties ought to be in funds, but they're always broke, for lack of a better word. Right. So maybe we have to have a policy around fiscal management so that what you get from the exchequer is used as seed money to keep growing to ensure that if you've got nominations, you actually have the money for it. Right. Now, the point that you made is very important, that when private citizens somehow fund political parties, then he who pays the piper calls the tune. You are obliged, therefore, to defer to whoever is seen as the person who's the benefactor or upon whose grace it is that the money is attracted. Because sometimes they don't give the money themselves, mm -hmm. but people see Ben is there and they think, you know what, Ben is a good guy. I think I can trust him with my, my two million shillings. So we have to move away from that because as long as it's coming from individuals' pockets, you will find lobby groups, you'll find other interest groups finding a way right. to even influence the manifestos and going as far as influencing policies as we have seen in other countries. Because the people who fund your campaign, you become beholden to them right. when you're successful, if you're successful. Prof, do you agree? Completely. Uh, the place of money in politics is a world of a conversation. And if you don't democratize how the money is gotten, that's how you have a problem. The reason why President Obama got to get people at the bottom to try to start contributing money to him was to avoid the situation where big business was owning him and mm. owning his parties. I think we have a problem in terms of how, part, how parties are funded. Despite the fact that we have a political parties fund, Ben, uh, the reality is a lot of the monies that get to run the parties are from people's private pockets. If you look at how much they're using in the campaigns, mm. you start asking yourself, is it possible that Ben can leave NTV today and go and run? Because the amount of money you require is huge. So therefore, there must be some unfair, some illegal sources. Right. There must be somebody who is bankrolling it. The danger is once that person starts doing so, then you start cutting out nominations like, but if this guy loses, the money will go away. Uh, so that's the thing that needs to be dealt with. I think after the 2017 elections, the Register of Political Party started a process of saying, how do we democratize our nominations? How do we think about how to fund it? And I think it's important that as a country, we really look at the funding of uh, party nominations to ensure right. that it is much more democratic. All right. Uh, Prof, I want to come to you, but I, I want to move to something else uh, be because of time. Uh, we were not only looking about at, uh, at the UDA nominations, we are also taking a look at what's happening elsewhere. And today, the ODM party uh, was carrying out nominations in the county of Homa Bay. Uh, it was a, a couple of uh, parliamentary seats. I think it was uh, Karachuonyo and Diwa. Uh, the others, the party has had consensus and uh, direct uh, uh, tickets are set to be issued. 
what what is your take on ODM's way of doing things this this time round? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, on ODM, I will first have to talk about technology, the application of technology in the nomination process. Because in my mind, I see Busia as a good example where technology was used effectively. And uh, then a few no seats that were there for competition uh, went quite well. I'm aware that uh, photos were just there. And even if you are illiterate technologically, you will go there and press on the photo of the person you are voting for and it will work. Uh, then ODM also did not go the UDA way where all the nominations were done on the same day. I think they have staggered their nominations and probably that could be a way of trying to avoid uh, a countrywide uh, uproar in the event that something goes wrong. Uh, but it's also a, a difficult moment because in the end I, am, I saw like in uh, Homer Bay, there are quite a bit of complaints about these direct nominations. Uh, people are not very comfortable that uh, a candidate uh, was given direct nomination over when there were other people who really wanted to compete. So I think that's uh, something for ODM to think about, something for ODM to learn, because it becomes very difficult when the people themselves feel like Anybody else can come as an independent and we shall vote for that person. And I think it happened somewhere in Syria in the last elections. So it's really important that the public this time feel more enlightened right. and they feel that they should be part and parcel of uh, the process of choosing their leaders. Uh, Prof, uh, we understand you have an emergency and you have to go. We'll let you go. Any final thoughts for us? Well, I, my final thought takes me back to the news today. One... Uh, we have good news that at least the government has finally addressed the issue of fuel. So I should be able to, to travel around and uh, get the, my, uh, to see what is going on in the Transoya County and be able to campaign for my candidate, uh, not George Natembea. And then secondly, I think uh, the issue of what happened in Parliament today was a bit shameful. I know how difficult the Speaker Muturi must have found himself in a situation where he's to get over a case that is pitting against his uh, the, uh, Kenya Kwanzaa boss. Right. And I think that was not very good. Otherwise, I, I hope that the results will be reflective of the people's will. My hope is that uh, there is, when the results come out to, tomorrow, we will have less complaints and that uh, eventually those are the results that will be binding. And we look forward to the general elections in uh, August. Thank you, Prof. Professor Masibo Lumala from Thank you the so Moe much. University. Thank you for having me. Asante Sana, Prof. From the yeah. Moe University uh, School of Information Sciences. Um, prof, as, as, as we wind up, um, we are at a very interesting place in, in terms of uh, the electioneering period. Uh, we are, we've seen the nomination exercise. By the 22nd of this month, they should be done with it, whichever way they've chosen to go. Um, we are seeing what's happening in Azamio, uh, kind of uh, coalition it is, a coalition political party, Kenya Kwanzaa. Uh, pandits say those are the two to beat. What is your crystal ball telling you uh, from this nomination, whatever the UDA gets from this and what Azamio has? Uh, a, few, a couple of months of the elections, what, what is your prediction? Ben, contrary to what people might say on the streets, I think this is a very close election. Uh, in my view. I think it's very close. That's number one. Uh, so I, t I was telling a friend of mine today when he asked, so how will we ever determine uh, what to vote for? I said, I think the next three months will determine. Uh, by around July, end of July, things will be slightly clear. That's the first thing that I think for me, my Christopher tells me. The second thing is I pray uh, that from what I've seen in the nominations, the way that we've had improvements in the nomination, that we can have a campaign, uh, Ben, that is peaceful. Because at the end of the day, what is much more critical is that we can be able to have a, a, a peaceful election. My last point, I think, for me in terms of what I see into the future, is this country is in a challenging space. Uh, whoever it is that takes over in August will have to make very, very critical decisions if this country must move on to the next level. Because contrary to rhetoric that you hear, I think the, the country is reeling. If you look at what we've gone through in terms of fuel, uh, ben, people carrying fuel in the 21st century in jerry I'm traveling up country and we're having a debate with my wife about 
do you carry fuel in the canals? Like we can't do so. But to have that kind of debate, uh, Ben, in 2022, it just tells you the kind of challenges we have as a country. All right. Joe, give me your crystal ball before I take your comment on fuel issues as we end up. Um, one of the things that I must commend Kenyans is the very spirited resistance to engage in political violence or to engage in um, monkey business, as it were. So we've seen a lot of the disruptions that are happening have been largely isolated and you can tell were well orchestrate, orchestrated, where before those would have been the spark that would start a, a huge fire, a snowball, people have basically just scattered around it. For me, I find that the Kenyan uh, voters are becoming more mature. We are coming into a situation where people are also tired of political violence and are communicating the same unambiguously to the leaders that, you know what, we want a, a credible situation here. The other thing that I thank um, the Kenyans for is that this time around we have the courage to also speak up. When we, we these early things that we're seeing on Twitter and on others, where some of the more famous names seem to be falling by the wayside, people are getting the courage to speak their mind. Mm -hmm. And for me, again, it speaks the maturity of the Kenyan people, that we're getting to a place where we are not afraid to swim against the grain. I, I keep telling people that we have a new demographic, that some of the younger people who are not beholden to the big leaders as we used to be. And so now we've gotten to a place where, for example, with the UDA nominations, the, the allusion that Prof said earlier, how the DP decided to let the people in the rift decide. It is, it's almost unprecedented because those of us who are old enough to remember uh, President Kenyatta won, and not Uhuru, but his father, he would interfere even with national yeah. elections. Forget about nominations. So you, you people have chosen Ben. No, you didn't mean Ben. You definitely meant Collins. And so he would switch things around without any regard. So my crystal ball tells me, by the time we get to the national elections, whether they're close or they're not, one thing we can be sure of, yes. people will be speaking unambiguously. It's not one of those things where it's a wave, it's a, people are choosing leaders. And that's why you're seeing leaders tearing off branding, deciding to go independent right. or to do what, because they've gotten to a place they've realized, you know what, the political parties take you a, 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 a ways, but if you're not a good leader yourself, the people are not afraid to tell you, by the way, you know what, we, we don't feel you, so we'll not choose you. All right. Prof, give me your final thoughts and tell me, do you think there are any lessons Kenyans can draw from these UDA nominations and the ODM ones as well and, and Jubilee as they conduct them and other parties as, as, as we head into the elections in, in, in August? I think uh, two things that for me we can be able to draw from it. The first one is citizens should be able to realize that actually they are, they have, the vote has power and that power is in their hands that the politicians can say whatever they do, they can try and bring on the money, but when you get into that polling session, you actually have the power to make the difference. And I hope that as we go to August, people can take the power into their hands. That's number one. Number two, and building on what Joya said, that violence is not a decision-making strategy. Let's use the vote and not violent means, because we have it within our powers to ensure you can try and manipulate us, but at the end of the day, it's our decision. Somebody told me something today, and they said, why should I spend all my energy voting when eventually I suffer and I don't have fuel? My answer to them was, let's realize when we go to vote that the decision we make has implications on whether that problem of fuel will be sorted or not. And that's, mm -hmm. for me, the greatest lesson from today's events. All right. Joe, your final thoughts? My final thoughts also would be that for political parties, this is also a chance to explore other ways of doing things. I was very glad to see ODM embracing technology because one of the things that does is when you have real-time results, the headache that now UDA has to count votes does not exist because with the ODM system, every vote is counted in real time. So that the, the, when you reduce the human interface, there is a certain growth. So I'm hoping most political parties will start investing in that direction. The other thing also that I would like to point out is just like a professor has said, we have to start drawing the line between our vote and our lives. Every choice has a consequence. And as long as Kenyans think about the consequences, the kind of, of future they envision for themselves, then we are able to take control of some of the things that have bedeviled right. us. We have reached at a place where, especially the people who are seeking elective office, now are all listening to the ground. Before, it used to be people will be led. 
now everyone is listening to the ground. I hope Kenyans realize how powerful they are and they're not afraid right. to go ahead and speak up loudly, speak up unambiguously. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the lawyer and governance expert, Joe M. Devo, uh, Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Nairobi, Professor Colin Zodotti, and of course, earlier today, Professor Masibo Lumala uh, from the Moy University. Thank you so much for your time today, to, tonight. As we continue to keep an eye on what's happening across the 35 counties where the United Democratic Alliance UDA held their nominations today, uh, our team still spread out across uh, this country to try and see how the vote tallying is coming along. Uh, some of that being delayed, obviously, for obvious reasons. We will continue to burn the midnight oil to make sure we give you <clears throat> the latest in terms of the results as and immediately they start to stream in. I'm Ben Kitili for all of us here on our wall to wall coverage of Decision 2022, the political party primaries. Thanks for watching and good night from Nairobi.